closing scene of the searchers. So, and I, in the book, I interviewed the uh, filmmaker who, who made it, who, whose politics are actually not at all in line with the Bush administration, but he, like a lot of people, I guess, was caught up in the moment. And he said, he said to me, you know, um, in pulling together these, these clips, the thing I was thinking about was um, rescue. It's like all these films are about, you know, rescuing. And of course, what he didn't say, but what was obvious in watching the film is it's all about rescuing helpless women. Um, Do you have to go to find an equal and opposite propaganda campaign? Mm, equal and opposite. To oh. What, to what wrote it? Oh. Uh, I think you get into the beginning of time, perhaps. Okay. Uh, um, you, you mean that I've gone in the other direction? Right. Uh, well, you know, the women's movement, uh, the peace movement, um, there have been many efforts to, to challenge. Um, uh, mythology. Um, I, we, it, that remains to be seen. I mean, I think we haven't even tried. Is the thing. I mean, we have yet, we have yet to even acknowledge what happened after 9/11. I mean, many uh, people. I think because we were a terrified and b. Um, you know, sleepwalking and, and, and see that there was such silencing of any kind of discussion or debate or dissent after the attacks um, that that whole period sort of went by in a blur. And then it was, oh, I'm, you know, we're so tired of 9-11. What we were tired of was, you know, the same, you know, four platitudes about everything changed and, um, and everything changed, and everything changed, and that was, and it's unimaginable, and it's the end of irony, and, the, and that was sort of the end of the, end of the discussion. Yeah. Well, didn't we have a, an opposite propaganda campaign during World War II to get women into the factories, mm -hmm. Rosie the Ripper, and all that? So, well, world, yeah, and, and I then at, at the end it was in Get 'Em All Back. Home. Right. And yeah. it, right. And I, actually, I talk. Yeah, I talk about that in the book because. That was one of um, one of the anomalies that um, perplexed me was, um, as much as in the first you know couple of weeks there were press accounts saying you know this is going to be our new day of infamy and now you know finally the baby boom will have its you know greatest generation we're going to all respond you know together um, that quickly uh, petered out and what replaced it was really a kind of 1950s reaction I mean here we were supposedly in a wartime mode, uh, yet we're talking about women going back to the home and, and I mean, and uh, there was a lot of talk about the return of a cold war, you know, cold warrior manhood. Um, what I came to um, in thinking about this was that um, the 50s actually, in a, in a fight, or in the end of World War II and bleeding into the 50s, was a period um, that did, in a sense, parallel our experience um, on 9-11 more than World War II. And what I mean by that is um, uh, World War II, you know, was a, it was a sort of, you know, old-fashioned, you know, clear, clear who, you know, fight against another or several other nations. Um, and as much as we were attacked on home soil, it was Pearl Harbor, which, you know, to most people seemed quite distant. Um, whereas uh, at the end of World War II, the dropping of, of the bomb um, by us uh, and the invention of uh, the guided missile and the long-range bomber uh, left us with the sense that we were no longer this protected, you know, fortress um, uh, continent in isolation, that we could be, um, you know, penetrated and violated at any moment. And it's very interesting when you go back and read um, the press accounts right after um, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki that uh, there was all this uh, sort of hysteria here about how, um, how frightened and threatened and vulnerable we were. And uh, there's much in press commentary about the, the quote unquote fear psychosis in America. Um, so again, it was, I mean, like with the Indian Wars where we put out all this violence and then there was all this sort of terror at what would ensue. Yeah. Uh, the one that struck me the most was um, uh, Shah 
show your loyalty to America. Go out and spend money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, that was, and, and the, uh, speaking of distinctions between World War II and, um, you know, I, the difference is we had this, um, uh, you know, chess beater in a borrowed flight suit telling us to max out our credit cards, <laughs> now, as opposed to World War II where we had a man in a wheelchair um, uh, giving us fireside chats and ap that appealed to our hopes instead of our fears. Um, and I, I don't, I think, he was suggesting we uh, save money, right, <laughs> and, and donate it to a cause. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I think it's very disturbing how much of the media of, of all kinds is in, under the control and ownership of conservative right-wingers such as Rupert Murdoch. And how is this message about insight and introspection going to really be mm. disseminated to the American people? Are you being interviewed on CNN or MSNBC and anywhere? Right. No, this is a very good point, and it's, um, I mean, you know, as a, as a journalist, or sometimes I feel like a former journalist, since I don't really identify with most of the journalists in today's, um, it, it's, it's horrifying. I mean, uh, my, you know, I, my, the last newspaper I worked for was the Wall Street Journal, and you, you know who owns that now. Um, and, you know, and, it, and it's funny because uh, one of the, uh, some of the journalists who interviewed me for this book say, well, you, you know, you quote, um, uh, cause some, some of the media you quote is conservative media. And so that, <laughs> you know, I want to say, well, excuse me, that, that is the media now, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, but even aside from the conservative media, what was stunning to me was how much of this was in you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, it, you know, it was all over the place. It was, you know, uh, New York Magazine, um, Atl uh, well, Atlantic Monthly is fairly conservative, but um, The Nation, you know, there were, um, uh, well, I shouldn't say, the, the Nation was one of the offenders who um, dropped women out um, after 9-11. Uh, after the, the Nation ran um, a whole issue that was devoted to uh, comment, you know, various diverse commentaries on um, about what, how we should respond. It was called in the title of, on the cover was a just response, and you open it up and they did not have one um, commentary by a woman. In fact, the entire um, issue had, uh, with the one exception of Katha Pollitt, who had a regular column, and that was the column she wrote on um, maybe flag waving isn't such a great idea, which was the column that she was horribly attacked for in um, all these uh, you know, publication, uh, uh, publications called her you know, a bad mother for denying her daughter um, uh, the pleasure of, uh, of uh, waving a flag when in fact her, I mean, she didn't deny her daughter anything. Her daughter put out the flag, she didn't. Um, but uh, so it, it, it isn't, it isn't even just the, even just the conservative media, and we can't even anymore say just conservative media since it's in, the, that's encroaching on everything. Yeah. I'm curious. I, I've read three. I haven't read this one, but I've read the previous two books, and I'm listening to this, and it sounds like this. It's got the same melodrama. Um, you've got you know you had, the, you had Sift, and, and as well we had men's issues. Where do you see this issue ever resolving? Is this the eternal issue, or I mean? I find it interesting that even 9-11 becomes a male-female issue, mm -hmm. invalidly so, it sounds like. And so what I'm saying is, where do you see the answers? I guess that you bring up a lot of questions. I guess I'm curious on conclusions, answers. Right. Well, I wish I had an easy conclusion. I mean, this what I'm talking about is so deeply ingrained in our um, way of thinking um, and has, you know, and we've reinforced it over and over. I mean, this is a, this is a, uh, a mindset that has, you know, we've been working on since um, since we first uh, miscast poor Daniel Boone as a um, as a, a guy who relished Indian killing when he in fact um, had, you know, a very different story and then uh, felt terrible shame about the three uh, Indians he had killed, um, you know. The place to start is 
by talking about it, by confronting it, by simply acknowledging that it exists. Um, and, you know, questions that involve uh, male and female roles are always, you know, horribly charged. I mean, you just bring that up and it's like, oh. Um, uh, and we're very, very invested in this, in this whole idea. Um, but I think one, I mean, just one, and it's a rather sentimental idea, but I'll put it out there anyway, is that we do have um, an alternative.